Hello and welcome to the Brutal Iron Gym Podcast, where our goal is to cut through the BS and deliver the brutal truth about topics related to health and happiness. Today's podcast is number 1,381. The topic is training and the title is Deadlift Weakness Training at a Commercial Gym. So we had a listener send in a question and it's kind of just a conversation basically uh, about how, how to train uh, deadlifts at a commercial gym. So when you don't have fancy bars, you don't have bands, or even like, you know, kind of great racks, uh, squat racks that you can use. So how do we do that? So let me read through what they wrote, and then I'll read you my response. So uh, just wondering if you could help me figure out accessory work for deadlift weaknesses in the deadlift. I'm training a group of co-workers at a commercial gym close by our work. I have one guy that needs lockout work and another guy that needs starting strength off the floor. Typically, lockout would be the easiest issue to fix. I have used reverse bands, block pulls, rack pulls, bands, chains, and plenty of other methods to overload the top end. Uh, I don't have access to the necessary equipment. Even in the rack, the pin's lowest setting is too high. That's incredibly frustrating, I'm sure. (laughs) Um... You have all this knowledge and you can't use any of it. That's very frustrating. Uh, I'm an old school powerlifter that's used band pull-throughs to drive the hips forward to help lock out. Is this exercise obsolete now? Would hip thruster be a better option? What exercises could we supplement here to improve lockout power? Uh, now, they continue to write, so I'll, I'll read the rest of what they wrote, then I'll come back and answer those questions. They move on and say, weak off the floor. I normally would train deficit deadlifts to increase starting strength. I I don't have a platform or equipment to do this either. I all I have also had success with eggshell deadlifts to increase time under tension on the eccentric half of the deadlift. Yeah, that's a great idea. Uh, is there anything else you would suggest to help with the initial pool? Okay, so... Love this stuff. Love it, love it, love it. Uh, It is very frustrating to train at a facility that doesn't have the necessary equipment. And uh, as a gym owner, like I'll tell you right now, you can't buy everything. I I wish I had an endless budget so I could buy everything, but then I would have to move uh, to a bigger location. There is a huge challenge um, in what you can afford than what you can buy that pays your bills. So for example, I lift at a commercial gym sometimes when I join my wife up in Charlotte. Uh, she works up in Charlotte, so I'll travel with her some days so we can share the commute and whatnot. And I'll train at a commercial gym up there and I've talked to the training staff. That uh, just happens. <laughs> it's just funny how eventually, you know, meatheads find each other. Uh, but we were talking and the training director uh, hates basically the setup of their gym, but the gym is set up for the crowd that does mostly cardio. So that training facility has a lot of amenities and the cardio section is three times the size. I'm not even exaggerating that three times the size of the weight room, like the weight section, which has machines and free weights. So it's, uh, 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 I'll save you all my rants, but it's a horrible, horrible setup for a personal trainer. I feel very bad for them. Uh, They don't have that great of equipment. The layout is so smushed and small. So there'll be like 100 cardio pieces or more. There's actually more than that, but there's like 100 cardio pieces, like 13 people beyond them. But the dumbbell section, the machine sections are packed. (laughs) So it'd be horrible to try to do a personal training out of that facility. I've trained out of like Bally's Fitnesses, a bunch of like other kind of like high-end type uh, commercial gyms. And the equipment is just awful. The environment's awful. I remember I used to do supersets and take dumbbells with me into the machine area to have clients do things back-to-back. And uh, I remember one time a boss was, like, not yelling at me, but he was correcting me and saying, like, hey, we're not supposed to take dumbbells into the area. I'm like, my clients are getting the best results out of everybody. They're happy. Like, ask any of them if what we're doing is working better than anything they've ever done. And the, the guy's like, I know it works. Just, you know, I'm getting yelled at and I'm going to yell at you. <laughs> so, um, but it is frustrating to, to not have a facility that matches what your training style is. Very frustrating. Now, we can still find things to make it work. What we want to look at here 
is we if we look the first thing I want to say here is this um, listener is referring to a conventional deadlift. So when he's talking about like deadlift issues, like deadlift off the floor, deadlift lockout, he's talking about a conventional deadlift. So that's what we're going to talk about today. He's kind of like talk through that. Now um, we have about four million other podcasts that I'm going to go through uh, at the end that'll give you a lot of uh, other tips and information. But today we'll kind of go through this and talk about what the options are when you don't have the, the best of equipment. So typically, if the lockout portion of the deadlift, meaning you can drive the bar off the ground, uh, but as the bar passes your knees, it kind of feels like it sputters out and you have trouble bringing your hips in. One main reason why that happens is the person was out of position from the start. So they were actually out of position from the floor. So they had their, and there's a bunch of different kind of reasons for it, but one potential reason can be is that their knees were a little too far in front of their uh, arms, like their elbows, and their hips were a little too low in the setup, but their thoracic spine, their upper back was rounded over to account for that. So they were able to drive it up off the floor because they have strong legs, but now all of a sudden the bar's out in front of where their hips are compared to the center of gravity of their foot, and they don't have enough leverage to pull the bar back because their hips are already too close to the center of gravity. So there's, uh, and that might be a little, like, too much to try to explain in words, but we have a YouTube uh, video. So if you go on YouTube and search Brutal Iron Gym Conventional Deadlift Setup, and you'll see a video of me talking about, like, the starting position and how you know if your hips are too low, too high, you know, where your knees are should be compared to your elbows and arms. Uh, there is a kind of like a nice kind of universal setup that most people should start at. And then you'd have to tweak kind of for personal reasons from there. But that video, again, Brutal Iron Gym Conventional Deadlift Setup, can explain that and kind of get you some information to start with. So that is going to be something we would look at uh, in general. Now, this this person who sent in the email, like uh, they coach people, they're regularly going to know all that. So they're already going to cover that. They're already good probably there. So, But if you are listening, if anybody else is listening, um, that would be a good place to start would just be making sure your setup is actually correct at the, at the beginning. So you might not actually have weaknesses as much as you're just not in the best position to show your strengths. There you go. Um, then from there, uh, to simplify things, um, the, the main weakness that probably that causes lockout issues is hamstrings and glutes. Are there potentially other ones? Yes, but this is going to be by far the, the biggest issue for most people. So what we want to look to do is we want to try to find ways to isolate the hamstrings and glutes and train them uh, where other muscles can't hide them, where they can't kind of like make up for weaknesses in those muscles. So we want to focus on hamstrings and glutes. Now, a big, 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 big component, and this is overwhelmingly a component that almost everyone misses when they're in the powerlifting world, is how they train their accessories. Everybody talks about picking the right accessory, but they don't often talk about training it in the right way. Typically, most powerlifters, they just kind of plow through movements, and they just are trying to basically move as fast and efficiently as possible. However, in your accessory work, so the work you do after your main lift, you're trying to actually stress singular muscles. You're trying to work on individual components. So if you just plow through everything, your, strength, your strengths are going to still take over as much as they can. And you won't have a lot of time under tension. So you heard the listener mention eggshell deadlifts. And we have a, a deadlift uh, podcast. It was just like two weeks ago that would explain that. It's podcast 1,363. It was a Q&A podcast titled, Should I Do Touch and Go or Dead Stop Deadlifts? So I go through and I explain the different types of deadlifts there are. So you can listen to that. But eggshell deadlifts is basically where you just, in between... Like you deadlift it to the top, when you lower it down, you're lowering it down under control, so you lightly touch the ground and then come right back up for the next rip, rep. So you're touching the ground like you're touching an eggshell and you don't want to break the egg. So it's a very slow, very controlled movement. That's a great way to add time under tension. But most powerlifters, when they train their accessories, they just plow through them and they just like, okay, I've got to do 10 reps. What do they provide to 10? And it's like, oh my gosh, like, what the hell? <laughs> you didn't even pay attention to what was actually doing anything. Um, now, I trained like a bodybuilder for over 10 years. So I came into strength training uh, with a, a, a muscle intention 
when I train, meaning that when I'm doing an exercise, I'm paying attention to what muscles are moving and what muscles are taking the stress load. So I actually had to learn to be more movement intention and move with momentum, move with fish efficiency. So I had to come from a bodybuilding world into a powerlifting kind of explosive world. If you've only ever done powerlifting and explosive, you probably don't have really good mind-muscle connection or even actually individual muscular control. So when you do your accessories, you want to move in a manner that stresses and challenges the singular muscles that you want, not that you're just trying to plow through the movement and get as much weight done or get it done as fast as possible. Now we have podcast number 220. So way back when, podcast 220, is a training podcast titled Muscle Intention vs. Movement Intention. I would highly suggest that you listen to this, anybody. Uh, if you're wanting to like get more out of your accessories and strength training, you have to train like a bodybuilder in your accessories. Not like a powerlifter, but a bodybuilder. So bodybuilders can learn from powerlifters, and powerlifters can learn from bodybuilders. So it's pretty cool how that kind of blends them together. But you do want to do your accessory lifts slow, controlled, no momentum, and really, really focus on muscular damage and muscular stress. Now, what accessories would I pick? Um, I'm going to, like, typically in a commercial gym, since I can't do all the other things I'd normally do, uh, I, I do prefer to do barbell RDLs, uh, Romanian deadlifts. If you don't know what that is, you can just pause the podcast and search for that on YouTube. But a barbell RDL, you can set it up on the front side of the rack if the J-Cups come to the front side of the rack. And you would basically just, like, set it up around, like, thigh height. You would pick it up one or two inches. Don't make the unrack too hard. And then you just step back six inches, you know, like, step back with your right foot, step back with your left foot, get enough space from the rack, and then do some RDLs. RDLs are top-range deadlifts where your shins remain vertical, so your knees actually never travel forward. Typically, the barbell is going to lower about two inches or so below your kneecap, and then you start to squeeze your hamstrings and glutes to lift back up to the top of the lift. So you're going to be lowering it a little bit past your knees, like two inches or so, but then squeezing back through your hamstrings and glutes to lift it back up. What you're trying to think of is trying to push your feet through the floor and squeeze your butt cheeks, basically, rather than trying to pull the bar up with your lower back. You're trying to think of flexing your glutes to drive your hips under the bar. Like you're trying to like squeeze your hips underneath the barbell as the barbell is coming up between the barbell and the floor, rather than trying to pull the bar up with your back. That can be one of the reasons why people str- like struggle with lockout is because they're trying to pull their shoulders back to get their chest and bar to come up when they actually should just be flexing their glutes to drive their hips forward. So a lot of lockout work should be your glutes pushing forward, not your lower back trying to pull the bar up and back. So barbell RDLs out of the rack are great. Uh, if your squat rack does not have the ability to have J-cups on the outside, and as you mentioned, your uh, you know like safety pins and stuff are kind of limiting the depth, you can just do barbell for RDLs off the floor. You would just set up uh, with a vertical shin. You'd have your hips back. You're gonna be your upper body is almost gonna be parallel with the floor. You're gonna be very bent over. Your knees are actually gonna be behind your elbows to start the lift, and you're basically just gonna do the RDLs from there. Now, you can do barbell RDLs, and again, this is with muscle intention, not movement intention. So you'd want to go without momentum, focus on stretching and squeezing the hamstrings and glutes. You can also do dumbbell RDLs, and I would use wrist straps to alleviate the grip issue because a lot of people, they can sustain longer and heavier weight loads with their hamstrings and glutes than they can with their grip. So if somebody's trying to do a set of 10, uh, like, dumbbell RDLs with say 80 pounds, they're going to move really fast. But if they use wrist straps and uh, actually aid your grip, you can probably use 100 to 120 pounds and you can go much slower and focus on what you're wanting to target, which is your hamstrings hamstrings and glutes, because your grip is no longer an issue. So I would definitely use wrist straps uh, on barbell and dumbbell RDLs. You don't want to train your grip. So you want to train the hamstrings and glutes to their full capacity. So you want to alleviate any kind of grip weakness that might get in the way or make you cause to stop the exercise before your hamstrings and glutes are fully uh, stressed. Then... A lot of hamstring curls. Uh, 
a shit ton <laughs> of hamstring curls. Uh, I prefer lying hamstring curls. I think they're the best. Uh, but if your gym has, does not have that, you can do a seated hamstring curl. But if you have the option, I would, I would say to do a lying hamstring curl. Uh, some commercial gyms, if they carry hammer strength, like light fitness equipment, you'll have a kneeling single leg hamstring curl. Badass machine. Great. Go ahead and just spend all day on that thing. Uh, now, the listener mentioned barbell hip thrusts. I've actually not seen a lot of crossover uh, from barbell hip thrusts to a conventional deadlift. Are they are they like a bad choice? No. I just don't think they're as effective as the other things that we've mentioned already. So barbell RDLs out of a rack, barbell RDLs from the floor, dumbbell RDLs, RDLs and then a crap ton of uh, hamstring curls. So those would be the ones that I would focus on the most. Can you mix in other things? Sure. Um, but I do think those are going to be kind of your, your best bets. Those are the bread and butter things that I typically would go to uh, with clients. Now, how often and how much? <laughs> uh, I would generally train your hamstrings and glutes twice a week. I would do a different variation each day. So um, between the two days, meaning if I train, you know, my hamstrings and glutes on Monday, then again on Thursday, I would do a different exercise on Monday versus Thursday. I would repeat the exercises for four weeks, aiming to make progressions in weight load or time under tension. And then after four weeks, I would move on and pick a different uh, variation. You want to make sure the body feels like it's constantly having to figure the movement out. Once your body feels efficient with the movement, you're no longer getting the muscle damage that you need to get the muscular response. So your job isn't to be good at the movements. Your job is to just suck the first week and then suck a little less each week, but you're not actually wanting to get good at it. Once you get good at it, you're not going to get much of a response from it, right? So our body will change and try to adapt to a stimulus that it can't do to a greater degree than a stimulus that it can do. So you want to make sure you pick things that are awful, and like not like not that they're not safe. Uh, they're safe. They just feel awful and you hate them. And then you just repeat that for four weeks and then try to move on to a different thing. You do not want to become efficient at these. You want to be safe, but you don't want to be efficient. You want to have your body constantly figuring, like thinking like, what the hell is this? And I don't like this. And this is miserable. And this is stupid. Because then it's going to adapt to it because you're repeating it over and over and over. So it realizes it has to adapt. Uh, one of the ways to explain that is, if I go out and I run a mile, and it's the first time I run a mile, I'm going to suffer, uh, but the adaptations I will make from weeks one, two, three, and four, I'll, ha I'll see a greater change in my ability from weeks one, two, three, four than I would from, say, the, the 15th, 16th, 17th, and 18th time of doing it, right? We're going to get a faster and greater degree of adaptation to a new stimulus than we would from an old ho-hum kind of used to this kind of stimulus. Then what I would do is typically, uh, after my squat and deadlift work, my strength-based work, I would add one to two of these kind of accessory movements. I would do three to four working sets and 10 to 20 seconds of time under tension. 10 to 20 seconds is very heavy for muscle and tension to movements, but it's great for building strength. If you ch choose a weight that's lighter than that and you go for longer than 20 seconds, you're going to create a lot of muscle damage, but it doesn't have as direct of a uh, conversion over to increased strength. If you go faster than 10 seconds, you're not even really accumulating enough time uh, to get a great strength effect unless you do a bunch of extra sets. So if I do like eight sets of five seconds, sure, you know, five seconds is, is really kind of short, but if I do eight sets of that, that's going to add up. But I also don't want to spend time in the gym to do eight sets of an accessory exercise. <laughs> so that would be too long. So I typically would do one or two of these movements uh, after my squat and deadlift. I would do three to four working sets, 10 to 20 seconds of time and attention. How do you know whether it's one or two, whether you do three or four? Uh, unfortunately, that's all kind of individual dependent. You can start on the lower end of that. So just do one of the exercises for three working sets. And you'll see that, okay, by the third, fourth workout, I, I still have energy at the end of the workout. I don't feel super sore between my workouts. So maybe I have capacity to add another movement. So that's something you just have to play with and say, okay, do I feel like I'm recovered enough by my next workout to perform well, but I didn't feel recovered and then had to sit there for days and days and wait until my next workout. Okay, now 
If we're looking at off the floor weakness, uh, again, that could be positioning. Your, the positioning just might not be good right from the start. So your hips might be too low, hips might be too high, and that can really negatively impact it. Again, you would check out the YouTube video, Brutal Iron Gym Conventional Deadlift Setup. That'll explain that for you. We also want to address the mindset that you take into the start of the lift. A conventional deadlift is a push from the floor, not a pull from the floor. So you're trying to push the bar off the floor using your legs, not pull the bar off the floor using your lower back. So one of the ways you'll hear people explain this is think of it as almost like you're doing a leg press at the beginning of the movement. So when you set up and you start your conventional deadlift, you're going to drive the bar off the floor and your torso, for the most part, is almost going to stay in the exact same position until the bar gets to your knees. And then the torso will start to upright. So what I mean by this is if you look at your the angle of your upper body when you're in good starting position from the conventional deadlift, right on the floor. As you push the bar off the ground, you'll notice that your torso angle doesn't change. Your upper body is tilted the same exact angle until the bar gets to your knees and then all of a sudden your torso will start to upright as the hips drive forward. You want to think of that when you're deadlifting and think, okay, I'm not trying to pull the bar up because that uprights my torso too early and my knees get in the way. So instead, I want to think of pushing the bar off the floor and keeping my torso at the angle it is until the bar gets past my knees. So you want to think of pushing, like a leg press, pushing the bar off the floor. That conventional deadlift is a push, not a pull. Then what we want to look at in terms of like weaknesses would be maybe like lats and core. Uh, that might be impacting the way in which the shoulders are held in the movement. Maybe you're losing too much um, bracing tightness in the abdominal muscles and kind of um, like lats and traps and whatnot uh, that your body feels the spine starting to curve. So therefore it down regulates, um, you know, drive and you can't get anything off the floor because the body thinks the, the discs of the, of the spine are, are at risk. So you want to have really strong lats and core. Then you look at general leg strength. So sometimes if somebody's kind of a big belly, you know, like kind of rounded upper back, they got a thick core, but they have no butt and no legs. <laughs> so the, the strength in the legs is going to be the issue, uh, to something to look at. So accessory exercises uh, for core work, lots of reverse crunches and planks. Just every type of reverse crunch and plank you can think of. Make it awful. Um, Make it so that way, whatever time and attention you ha you're using, you're use it, you're doing it for 30 seconds or less. If you can do the exercise for greater than 30 seconds per set, then it's not a hard enough exercise for you. So definitely look at reverse crunches and different plank variations. For lats, one of the best things is just cable seated rows, just really heavy ass cable seated rows, um, with a wide overhand grip mostly. But the difference is. You want to do it with that muscle intention versus movement tension. Do it where you're trying to feel the lats stretch and squeeze and the mid-back stretch and squeeze. Don't just fly through it pulling with your arms and just get all 10 reps in but not actually have the quality uh, that you would need to actually work the targeted muscles. So what you're going to want to do is just make sure that you're controlling the movement so that way this the lats get most of the work not just that there's momentum like throwing things around now i have a, a two podcast i mean two youtube videos you can check out uh one is uh, brutal iron gym technique tips cable seated rows and i just realized the other one is named damn near the same thing <laughs> so uh but those uh two videos uh, the one is Brutal Iron Gym Technique Tips Cable Seated Rows. The other one is Brutal Iron Gym Technique Tips for Cable Seated Rows. Uh, I made them uh, apart from each other, so I definitely didn't notice that I named them the same. Uh, but definitely check that out. It'll talk about how to do the muscle and tension variation uh, and really focus on building and strengthening the lats, not just moving with uh, you know momentum as the main driver. Then for legs, uh, commercial gym, leg press, 
You can do a low narrow stance, hack squat if they have one, and then dumbbell walking lunges. I know that those aren't discussed often in regards to like strength training, but I would use wrist straps again to alleviate grip issues. And if you do some heavy ass walking lunges, you're going to build some super freaking strong legs. Uh, people who tend to have weak glutes and weak legs, they will hate walking lunges because their lower back can't take over and protect for them uh, with other movements that it can. So trying to get decent at walking lunges, if you suck at them, uh, is going to make you a lot stronger uh, in leg strength for the conventional deadlift. How much, how often? Pretty much the same thing. Train these muscles twice a week. Uh, different exercise variation each time of the week. Repeat for four weeks and then move on. Uh, again, one to two elements, like one to two of these exercises after your typical squat and deadlift work. Three to four working sets, 10 to 20 seconds of time under tension. Okay, so we have a ton of other deadlifts. I'd like to just, uh, deadlift podcasts, I'd like to just spit out at you. So if any of these titles, um, you know, kind of perk your interest, you can check them out. We did talk about podcast 1,363, Q&A podcast, Should I Do Touch and Go uh, or Dead Stop Deadlifts. Great way to talk about the differences and the benefits of each. Um, We also have... Podcast 1104 is a training podcast. It's titled Exercise Programming Romanian Deadlifts. So you can learn more about RDLs if if that's something that's new to you. We also have Podcast 1079 is a training podcast titled Deadlift and Upper Back Training for Bigger Lats. So that way you can hear about that. We have Podcast 1046, which is a training podcast titled Programming for a New deadlift PR. I actually talk through, I think like an eight week rotation, uh, ways you can build a big, uh, a new PR, uh, deadlift. Uh, if you use the, the concepts that are explained within that podcast, and we have about 4 million other ones. I think I'm probably just going to like bore you to death if I name all these things. Um, but if you listen to the ones I already mentioned, you're going to hear them probably reference, uh, the, the older ones. So that would be definitely something good to check out. Uh, if you have like lower back pain, for example, in squats and deadlifts, podcast 246, way back when, is a training podcast titled Reducing Lower Back Pain During Squats and Deadlifts. So that would be a great one to check out as well. Uh, so just tons of good content out there. If you go to Podbean, um, like our Podbean page, which is uh, like uh, HTTPS, you know, semicolon or whatever the heck that little two dot thing is, slash slash, it's brutalirongym.podbean.com. Now, if you go to that, you can see, if you go to the middle of the page, there would be the the top title of whatever our deadlift is. I mean, our podcast is for that day, uh, which would be actually the one you're listening to right now. (laughs) So I record these a day early, so I almost forgot to mention that. But you'll see on that page, again, it's brutalirongym.podbean.com. There's uh, like our banner logo, and then in the middle of it um, is kind of uh, like the podcast title to the right side. Uh, towards the middle of the page, to the right side, there's a search window. You can actually just type in, like, say, deadlift, and you're going to see a lot of our past podcasts that relate to deadlift. So if you do it that way, if you use that search function, it helps a lot. So I'm clicking at it right now. I just did it right now. And you can see now, I can see podcast 1,363, 1,118, 1,004, 1,104, 1079, 1046, 1032, 911, 767, 756. There's all these podcasts that have to deal with uh, deadlifts. So this is an option if you ever need to search for a podcast topic uh, of ours because out of 3,000 like 1,300 and some podcasts we've done for like too many to remember but if you want to know if we've ever covered anything going to brutalirongym.podbean.com and to the middle right side of the page is a search function and you can just type in the term hit search and then you'll see all of the podcasts we've done with that keyword in the podcast awesome Well, that was uh, probably a ridiculous amount of information, but I hope it was useful. If anybody else has any questions or follow-up things, just reach out. I love when people send in questions. Thank you very much. So thank you to the listener who sent this in, and thank you to anybody else who considers sending something in. Uh, I'm just always available. I'm always happy to help. That's the whole point of what this podcast is for. So thank you for making me feel useful. (laughs) So I appreciate that. Uh, If you like today's podcast or the podcast in general, please consider sharing the podcast. The more people we share it with, the more people can help, and that's the whole goal. 
Thank you to the patrons of the podcast, people who financially support the podcast, which you can now do on our website. Uh, the podcast is over $1,000 a year. I give an hour to it every day. Uh, so I really appreciate the financial help to help kind of have this make more sense to do. <laughs> uh, I want to keep it for free and I want to keep it every day. So I really appreciate the financial help so we can do that. Uh, again, you can give a donation on our website, www.brutalirongym.com. There's a link there to do like a one-time donation, monthly donation, or yearly donation. I appreciate everybody who does that. It really does help us uh, keep doing these. So thank you very much. If you like the information we share in our podcast, you can find more from us on our social media channels on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube under the name Brutal Iron Gym. If you have any questions, feedback, suggestions, anything that you want to know, let us know in our email at brutalirongym at gmail.com. As always, I hope this was helpful, and thank you for listening.